I'm Wendell, this is level one, Linux. We sell Linux and Linux accessories. Well, it sells maybe a bit strong of a word. Today's launch day for Zen 4. Oh boy, we've got a really exciting video here. <laughs> Great news for you. I've got the 12 and the 16 core processor up for diagnostics, testing, a level one diagnostic. Ah, you see what I did there? Star Trek fan, you know. I've tested the X670E Tai Chi from ASRock, the X670E Hero from Asus, and the X670E Steel Legend, which is the most affordable board of, of the bunch. These are all the launch day boards. But don't forget, the B650, a lesser expensive chipset, is coming in October, which is like, what is that? Like tomorrow, a couple of days from now? I don't know, it's, September's basically already gone and you're probably already watching this in the future anyway. So you can get something that's a little bit less expensive. Listen, I'll be honest with you. If you're on Linux, PCI Express 5, not gonna do anything for you right now, today in September. Probably also not in October. I mean, you could maybe get PCI Express 5.0 storage, but you're a Linux user, you know that it's not about the raw throughput. I mean, a PCI Express 5 M.2 could theoretically transfer information at peak at about 10 gigabytes per second, but that round trip single IO is not gonna get any faster. The thing that is the fastest for IO is Optane, but Intel's kind of abandoning Optane. But you get the Samsung 990, which is PCI Express 4 anyway, Forget about it. PCI Express 5, I'm not gonna do anything for you today. But these processors, these processors will do a lot for you today. I've got a bunch of benchmarks. I use the Pharonix test suite. I'm sure that Pharonix.com has a whole bunch of other tests with open benchmarking. I also did some real world benchmarks and some gaming benchmarks and that sort of thing. I use the 6750 XT along with the 6950 XT from ASRock. I mean, the 6950 is like, you know, super high end, but this is the sweet spot. This is the deal. The 6750 XT, this one's from ASRock Phantom Gaming. And I'm, I'm real high on ASRock for this video because error correcting memory support. This is almost headline. I know a lot of Linux users really like this. This is a true error correcting dim. Notice there's five chips on each side not just one side. You know, in the past, you'd have eight chips and then nine would be error correcting or something like that. But DDR5 is a little different. We have 10 chips. There's two chips because there's two channels. Each channel has its own hardware error correction. I said this in some of our other launch day videos. There's actually a whole bunch of videos about AM5 and the AMD platform and everything that they're doing up on Patreon and Floatplane and our main level one text channel. Definitely check that out. But ECC, all DDR5 has what's called on-die ECC, and the marketing materials will refer to on-die ECC, but they're not talking about these extra chips that store you know, correction and redundancy information that you can do true error correction. That on-die error correction is sort of a lightweight error correction. This is sort of what you should be expecting when people say error correction, because without the other error correction, it just wouldn't work at all. Like it's not, oh, something unusual happened. We had some background cosmic radiation that flipped some bits, which is what this is designed for. You know, the 24-7, 365 uptimes that we on Linux enjoy. This is what this is designed to address. Now this DDR5 is 4,800, but I've got some good news. DDR5 6000 is stable on all of these across the board. And that's with Linux and that's with everything else. The overclocking features and everything else, stable across the board. I am sorry to report that error correcting memory does not work on our ROG Crosshair X670E Hero from Asus. But it does work on our ASRock boards, our X670E Steel Legend and our X670E Tai Chi. And if you're thinking about building a Linux workstation from one of these, my recommendation would probably be the X670E Steel Legend. The main difference is the X670E Tai Chi gives you an extra PCI Express 5.0 slot, but the X670E Steel Legend still has a PCI Express X16 physical slot. It's just four lanes big and it's at the bottom of the motherboard and it's only PCI Express 3.0. So you've only got one PCI Express 5.0 by 16 slot and then you've got one M.2 that's also PCI Express 5. Uh, and the, the Tai Chi is a little bit more higher end. You've got a you know two and a half gig LAN. It's killer E3100, two and a half gig LAN. Killer is code for Intel. Intel, it's, it's the Intel you know consumer division, but you know, there it is. I'm not aware of a workstation motherboard, but if you want to see me review a particular, you know, like workstation class motherboard with Linux, I will be glad to. 
The AM5 socket is all new. The boards are all new. You know, like I say, there's going to be B650 motherboards coming that are maybe hopefully going to be a little bit less expensive. Both of these boards ran a 16 core processor just fine. So you're not going to be limited on these motherboards in terms of, you know, CPU or anything like that. But these CPUs do consume quite a bit more power than their predecessors. I mean, we're talking about 220 230 watts socket power 230 watts socket power 170 you know 170 watt tdp if you're going to run it at defaults you do need probably a 280 or a 360 millimeter cooler the noctua d15 could just barely keep up but under really heavy multi-core workloads you will be seeing something close to the tj max of 95 degrees c it's, it's normal that these processors run hotter than their predecessor. The new processors, new designs, new everything. And so this is AMD's expectation. And they say it's normal and I didn't encounter any stability issues with regard to thermals or anything like that, especially running through our own benchmarks, but something to be aware of. The other thing is that the curve optimizer, if you're into tweaking, the curve optimizer gives you some options. So you can use the curve optimizer to do what you would think of as traditional overclocking, except the curve optimizer is really all about controlling power into your CPU. It just so happened that our 7950 CPU was particularly good, at least maybe it's particularly good, maybe they'll all be really good, but 5.88 gigahertz in Linux, uh, tweaking everything just a little tiny bit, it's 5.85 out of the box as long as you can keep it under 50 degrees C for a single thread. If you want to get into the curve optimizer, you know, you can do 5.3, 5.4 ish all core, but for most of the stuff that we saw in the Pharonix benchmarks at stock, it's more like 5.1, 5.1 and change. For testing, I used Fedora 36 with kernel six. So I was running the latest uh, you know, it's not the release version of kernel six cause kernel that's not out yet, but I was running, I think it was uh, release candidate five, release candidate six, something like that. I was tempted to try the Fedora 37 beta, but there were too many changes with the benchmarks that I wanted to run under the Pharonix test suite. And I didn't want to have to fight with upgrading and updating that. Uh, I wanted to use the comparison systems that were available in the Pharonix test suite uh, to compare the platform because, you know, AMD claims 29% average IPC uplift and that's pretty much in line with their claims if you're if you're going to use a Linux system. Now these are all the same cores. There's not, you know, big dot little cores or anything like that that you would have on the Intel platform. I know that Linux users are still some of them somewhat experiencing some teething issues with big dot little cores. See those threads on our forum. I mean, you know, how serious are those issues? Not super serious. Sometimes it can lead to some performance anomalies in games, but you know, generally Alder Lake, that kind of thing. For the 12th generation Alder Lake CPUs, these CPUs sweep the table. I mean, 12, 16 cores, outperforming by a significant margin, yeah, it's pretty good. If you've got an older Threadripper system, this might be an upgrade path for you. I mean, theoretically, we might see a workstation class motherboard based around X670 that gives us a lot of PCIe lanes. These CPUs have four more PCIe lanes than their predecessors, and everything is PCI Express 5, so you could break that out into more PCI Express 4 resources with the appropriate bridges or PLXs. Now for IOMMU testing, I actually added some PCI Express 3.0 PLX bridges just to see what would happen. And not only did they work correctly when the PCIe lanes were coming from the CPU, not through the chipset, uh, it also allowed me to break out each node on the PLX bridge into its own IOMMU group. So I used eight PCI Express lanes to break it into 16 PCI Express 3.0 lanes through a physical PLX bridge. And then I plugged four M.2 into that and every single one of those M.2 was broken into its own IOMMU group. For these two motherboards, IOMMU on gives you a few more IOMMU groups than IOMMU auto. For the ASUS board, there's no difference between auto and on, which I think is probably a mistake and probably will be corrected in BIOS versions but uh, that's only if you're into VFIO and pass-through. It is a little bit annoying that if you are into VFIO and pass-through that there's not really enough PCIe slots here in my opinion, but the other big thing with AM5 is it has onboard graphics. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the launch video, check that out. But the onboard graphics means that you've got two RDNA2 compute units and most of these motherboards have some kind of display output, whether it's HDMI or built into the USB-C connection. Now our Tai Chi here actually has enhanced USB 4 Type-C. 
It's using a Maple Ridge controller. And if you're thinking, wait, that sounds like Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt has to be qualified by Intel. This is everything Thunderbolt, but not the name Thunderbolt. Just so we're clear. And to my surprise, that actually did also work correctly-ish on Linux. And hot plug, hot plug can be a little sketchy. I'm not sure if that's kernel four or just, you know, it's muscle memory for me at this point, but it's pretty awesome to see that. And it's pretty awesome to see the onboard graphics output capabilities of AM5 with Linux, especially when we're talking about VFIO. You throw a looking glass on this thing with a nice discrete GPU, that's pretty awesome. This is a pretty awesome system. You can have two discrete GPUs, two VMs with real physical hardware. Maybe you could pass through the other one. Uh, it's, there's, there's some different options there that could be really exciting for that. And so I'm gonna do some separate videos on that. Don't, don't rush out for an IOMMU build yet because these are very early BIOSes and there's a couple of minor teething issues. I'm gonna do another video on that in a couple of weeks. So wait for that maybe. Plus also I wanna see about B650, because I think B650 might be a better deal and maybe we'll get some, you know, some slower PCIe slots because these things are absolutely built for PCI Express 5 and really fast graphics and other peripherals and I'm not really sure about that. But anyway, that's enough rambling. Let's go to the Linux benchmarks. So I did two sets of benchmarks. One comparing to the 1500X 3D on Linux and the other just sort of as a general comparison, you know, to the 5950X and to look at that. So, you know, a lot of fun. First up, WireGuard and Linux networking stress test. That's a pretty good improvement. 127 seconds versus 149 with a 5950X. It's quite a dramatic improvement in the, uh, the Bio CLZ compressor. You know, just Cloverleaf, uh, you know, uh, Eulerian Hydrodynamics, 1.6 seconds versus 3.65. That's a speed up of like a billion percent. Rodinia, Rodinia shows pretty good games. You can go through the benchmarks here, there's a solver. Some of this you have to keep in mind though is that these are older benchmarks for like the 5950X and the software has been more optimized. The name of the game here is optimization. AMD is a relentless execution machine consistently executing. Most of the changes in Zen 4 are in the front end, although we did get AVX 512. And so AVX 512 benchmarks kind of factor in a little bit here because hey, we can run AVX 512 on AMD CPUs now, but not until 12th gen CPUs. They took 5VX 512 out. I mean, it was there and then they took it out. That's so weird. Anyway, I digress. So when you look at something like FFTE, complex fast Fourier transform routine, and you look at that number and you say, that can't possibly be right. And yet it is. <laughs> what I just said was a lot of words to say, math go fast now. Same kind of thing with Monte Carlo simulations. What have they done? 68 seconds versus 180 with the 7950X. So yeah, if you're looking to build a ridiculously insane Linux workstation, you know, the 12 or the 16 core, it's probably for you. You can run a lot of virtual machines, 128 gigabytes of DDR5 capacity today, asterisk. The asterisk is that DDR5 is not going to run at DDR5 6000 when you have four sticks of memory. Four sticks of memory is a really high electrical load. You'll be lucky to get 4800 in all honesty, but that's going to have to be a video for another day. You can check out our, our memory video, which if it's not up, will we'll be up pretty soon but 64 gigabytes, two 32 gigabyte DIMMs, that would be my recommendation for this platform today. And you'll have an upgrade path to go to 128 gigabytes. Theoretically, GDR5 should support 256 gigabytes of memory in four DIMMs soon-ish, but that's not a thing that you can buy right now today as far as I'm aware. ZSTD compression, you're rocking out on the new ZFS. It's very nearly twice as fast as the 5950X. My goodness. So yeah, that's why I say, you know, 16 cores here is entering past-gen Threadripper, you know, this Threadripper 2000 series. I mean, 32 cores versus 16 cores. These 16 cores would be much, much nicer to have. Now it's a bit rushed getting this video out the door. Maybe this can be a little bit of an engagement challenge. For the H.264 and H.265 encoding, that iGPU has the capability to do encoding on board. I'm pretty sure that the 7950X encoding here, where we go to, you know, 271 uh, frames per second versus 172, I'm pretty sure that is just a software gain 
doing it the long way, doing it without the iGPU acceleration. I don't think FFmpeg has been updated to do this. There is, um, you can get AMD's proprietary Vega driver for Linux and just use the library from that. You don't have to install it. I tried that, but there was some kind of a strange issue with that and I didn't have time to address it before the video, but I'm pretty sure this will be even faster if we can use a hardware encoder and the two RDNA2 compute units that are actually on board our 7950X. Now, as with the case with the 5950X, this remains a uh, compiler beast machine. The timed PHP compiler takes about 35 seconds. Compiling the Linux kernel takes about 30 seconds. This is not really a dramatic improvement over the last generation when you look at, that, look at it that way. What you actually need to do is run KC Bench. It's the kernel compile benchmark. And this is sort of a different way of approaching it. It's the number of kernel compiles per hour, and it does a bunch of kernel compiles in parallel. And that is where you can really start to see a difference between the 5950X and the 7950X. So if you do things in the background, like compile, but you want to continue to still use your editor and do everything else, the 7950X is gonna be more of a better experience for what you, the user, experience than you would expect if you were just looking at numbers on a graph. Running Visual Studio Code while also compiling Clang, you're gonna barely even be aware that Clang is running in the background. You might notice that your clock speed's not 5.8 gigahertz in lightly threaded things. It's more like 5.1, 5.08, something like that. But that's still pretty crazy. I mean, five gigahertz is the base clock in one generation. I mean, we've, we've moved the CPU clock speed like 800 megahertz and all the cores are the same. There's not, we didn't, we didn't do anything weird architecturally that some of the cores are faster and use more power than the others. It's, there's, it's just all the same. The uh, in Queens search was one of the few benchmarks where it seemed like the performance was a little worse. That may actually be down to platform differences. You know, keep in mind, I am running a newer version of the Linux kernel, which has a lot more stuff in it. And uh, I don't know if I'd really call the, you know, 0 0.2 seconds difference uh, a regression, but it's not really much speed difference than the 5950X for in Queens, so uh, keep that in mind. Blender benchmark, of course, rendering benchmarks, those are always pretty good. Fishy Cat, compute CPU only from 102 seconds to 75.12. Not a bad showing, it's pretty good. That kind of leads into the next thing that I wanted to talk about is even if you're not into overclocking, Curve Optimizer can still be for you. So this CPU is really designed with eco mode and controlling the power limits front and center. If you're not comfortable with a, you know, 170 watt TDP on your CPU and you want to run less, you can. The CPU was perfectly stable with a TDP of 65 watts, which of course is going to use a little bit more power at the socket, but at 65 watts, the 7950, the TDP 70, 65 watts, the 7950 was faster than the 5950X across the board. So if you want 5950X performance at a, just a hair less than half the socket power, you can do that on this platform, just about half the socket power. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, you can do that with the CPU. And we still have an iGPU. How insane is that, that the CPU <laughs> has gotten so much more power efficient that yeah, if you want to keep the performance the same, the 5950X was enough for you. You can, you know, you got your camper or something, you're running off a DC inverter. Uh, that's pretty substantial. Also makes cooling and small form factor builds, ultra small form factor builds, maybe a little easier if you're willing to run with those lower power points. Now, some of the small form factor coolers that I like, um, such as the ones from Scythe, you know, they've already come out and said, no, this is not going to be compatible with the AM5 CPUs, even though it's physically compatible. I mean, your, your cooler layout, the mounting holes on AM5 are exactly the same as AM4, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea to use one of those older coolers on the newer AM5 platform. And certainly in the small form factor uh, genre is where I would doubly caution you with that. And I know a lot of the Linux enthusiasts out there really love their quiet, low power machines and not necessarily fanless, but very low RPM fans. This is the platform for you. It sounds counterintuitive because it's like, oh, they've upped the power so much more. But if you can manage the heat between 65 watts and the 65 watt TDP and like 105 watt, you can dial in whatever you want. The system will be stable. You, you will be able to find the stability in that power envelope. You can run at whatever power you want. And once you get much past 
the socket power of you know 105 watts 110 watts you're in the 90 percent uh, of native performance category it really is a bathtub curve when you let the cpu use all of the, the power that it wants to it will it use a lot of power and generate a lot of heat it also depends a little bit on silicon lottery when you start turning on the overclocking stuff the cpu uh, you can set negative offsets that will help you find um, where your CPU needs to be in terms of the amount of power to get something done. And my experience with it was that it was shockingly stable. So you can set minus 10, for example, that's usually pretty safe. Minus 20, it'll do up to minus 30, but minus 10, and that's gonna dramatically reduce the amount of heat and power that your CPU uses to get the job done. And as a result of that, uh, you probably won't see much, if any, performance fall off. You can get more aggressive with it, and you may see performance fall off. You could see some instability, but 99 out of 100 times when I was doing testing and benchmarks and things like that, when I was doing, when I was messing with the power curves and the stuff in Curve Optimizer, I would just make it slower. I wouldn't actually introduce instability, which means that AMD has done a lot of work on these features. I could maybe introduce stability going the other way, you know, dialing things up. But dialing things down, it was really hard to introduce, somewhat hard, somewhat hard, to introduce instability into the system. Most of the time, the instability came from messing with memory, memory clocks and running outside the JEDEC specifications and that sort of thing. So something to keep in mind. This platform does officially support up to 5,200. 6,000 is the sweet spot for you know, low latency, maximum performance. But 6,000 is an overclock, technically. 5,200 maximum supported. 4,800 is the JEDEC standard. So uh, just keep that in mind. I'd also be sure to check out the other benchmark link, which is just a comparison against the 5800X 3D. I didn't want to leave that out. So overall, bottom line, for Linux, this is the CPU. It's pretty well supported in kernel 6. You do need kind of a newer kernel. I'm using Fedora, like I said. I'm not using the beta version of Fedora. I just put a newer kernel on older Fedora. That works really well. This is uh, shockingly mature. You know, I'm thinking about like the Zen launch five years ago. I'm thinking about now and for as much work as AMD has put into this platform and as many things are new, it's surprisingly stable in pretty much all aspects. The least stable aspect of the platform is DDR5 and in testing other platforms from Team Blue and testing other sort of configurations, DDR5 is not exactly stable everywhere anyway. So I feel like those issues will be worked out. The AMD platform does support something called Expo Memory, which I talk about in, a, in another video. You can learn more about that. It's a profile for the DDR5 memory, specifically for AMD systems. I mean, this platform is designed for DDR5. You should get a memory kit that supports Expo. It will be less headache. Um, but other than that, it's fine. I went out to Micro Center and I bought a bunch of kits that weren't Expo because I wondered, just like, what's the headache really going to be like? It wasn't super bad, but... It wasn't a lot of fun either. It's definitely something that's going to get tweaked going forward with BIOS versions. So anything that I tell you today is probably not going to be useful tomorrow when there's a new BIOS version for these boards. This thing's launching. You can buy it. If you've been holding out to build a Linux workstation in 12 or 16 cores, sounds about right. Or you have any questions, hit me up on the forum at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out and I'll see you there. <laughs> oh boy, this is the platform for Linux. Very nice. Good job, AMD. Very happy to see true DDR5 support on this platform. Good job, ASRock. All right, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums.